cross. And so we're going to be there still for a couple of weeks. So last week, we looked at the cross and legalism, spinning the legalistic plates, getting, getting all these things done to keep us, to get us saved and to keep us saved and to add to the cross and to make sure that we don't fall off the cross. And, and just the craziness thereof. And so um, if you're not too sure, please have a listen to that. It's all available. This morning, we're talking about the cross and condemnation. So the first enemy of the cross was the cross and legalism. Legalism, trying to build my relationship with Christ on my knowledge of Christ and my doing for Christ. Kind of skipping the heart, going from knowledge to doing, adding to the cross, but not having an actual relationship. So this morning we're talking about condemnation, the cross and condemnation. Are you... This is the question. Are you sometimes overwhelmed by the things you have done that you shouldn't have done? Perhaps when you were backpacking through Europe in the 70s, 80s, 90s, etc. Are you sometimes overwhelmed by the things you haven't done that you were supposed to do? Or the promises you made that you never kept? Or the things you vowed to never, never, never do again? Only to do it again, and then again and again. Are you sometimes reminded of, of past sin by just a smell or a place or something that you see or that you hear? It's, it's amazing how many nods I'm getting. I was, I was, all of these was meant to be rhetorical. You could have just sat there. <laughs> but, but you're wonderfully honest. The question actually is, when you are reminded, how do you feel? How do you react to that? What does that cause inside of you? The Springbok rugby team, they have quite an entourage traveling with them. Whenever they go on tour, there's obviously the, well, the times that he's allowed to go with, the famous, infamous director of rugby, there's the head coach, there's uh, assistant coaches, one for the forwards, one for the backs, there's defense coaches, there's the fitness conditioners, there's the managers, there's the medical staff, the doctors, the physios, the biokinesists, the, the, the guys with output portfolio, and then last but not least, there's someone called the luggage or the baggage manager. He's, he's there to make sure that you, we don't find Eben Etzebeth having to run out with Faf de Klerk's um, gob, because he even got his own bag. So a really important character. But this is not quite about them. It's about the fact that, that sometimes we as individuals, as believers, we seem to need one of these, one of these luggage, baggage managers. Because sometimes, because of, of all the things that, that we are reminded of, that, that list of should have, shouldn't have, could have, might have's, even when we are not heading out anywhere, even when we're not going anywhere, we need an entire fender trailer just for all the luggage, all the baggage, and all the stuff that we're carrying and that Satan keeps on loading onto us. And that's all condemnation. I want to ask a question quickly. If God was to send you a WhatsApp now, God is into technology, by the way. Um, he's just not on Facebook. But... Um, if God was to send you a WhatsApp right now, how would it read? Again, it's rhetorical, but, you, but I want you to think about it. You don't have to shout it out, but you can just think about it for a moment. I've got two options for you. Is it going to be time to get it together down there, buddy? Really? Again? You? Come on. Or is it have a wonderful day, my boy. You are so special to me. How I love being your father. I'm so proud of you. See, condemnation, the second enemy of the cross. It takes many forms. I think sometimes all of us, especially looking at the nods earlier, tend to suffer from the enemy of condemnation, from the father who feels that he was away too often due to work or to whatever while his children were growing up. And so he, he missed too many of his son's rugby games. 
perhaps never able to get to the, uh, the parents' day at the, the daughter's dance class, to the single mom that never had the time or the money or the energy to spend time with the boys just because you were so busy trying to keep the ship from sinking. Or the guy who finds himself sinking deeper and deeper into pornography. Or the girl that was pressured into having an abortion. And so somehow, that weight of condemnation has been with you for such a long time that you kind of feel used to it. And as I said, we, we all, at some stage, sometimes, feel that pressure and that weight of condemnation. You don't have to be an axe murderer or a politician. <laughs> Just like legalism, condemnation follows us as closely as our shadows. In this case, reminding us of a shadowy, shady past. The reality is, if it had not been, if, if, sorry, if you have a short attention span, the next two minutes is all you have to listen to. Okay, this, this is the important part. The reality is that if it had not been for the bloodstained cross of Jesus Christ, it would have been absolutely perfectly normal to go through life overwhelmed by condemnation. But without placing our faith in the cross of Jesus, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, without that, we all deserve to be judged, we all deserve to be condemned, and we all deserve to be severely punished for our sins. But yet again, the Bible has great news. And normally, if things were working together, we would go, boom, baby, and Romans chapter 3, verse 1 to 3 would be behind you. Fortunately, you can just listen to it. It's that one you know so well. Therefore, wherefore, because we actually have placed our faith in the bloodstained cross of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of our sins, now therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ, because through Jesus Christ, the law of the spirit of life set me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do in, because it was weakened by the sinful nature, what the law was powerless to do, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of man to be a sin offering for man for us. And therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You can shout amen, hallelujah, applaud, and then you can stop listening. For those that were born before or earlier, with the longest attention span, guys, the rest of us, okay, the, the, the rest is, the tragedy is that even though we've all heard this, we probably know that it's from Romans, and you now know that it was was from chapter 8. We all, we've all heard it before. Most of us can even at least quote that, but there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Never mind the rest, the before and the after. But that does not mean that as Christians, we are free from condemnation. We know it's there, we can quote it, but it doesn't mean that we're free. It's almost like knowing about CrossFit. <laughs> I can actually tell you where to find the George Chris CrossFit Center. <laughs> Doesn't mean that I'm CrossFit. <laughs> I'm neither cross nor fit at the moment. In any event, that wasn't in the note. Um, you might have been able to tell. So the, so the test is, even though you know about it, you've heard about it, you can quote it, the test is quite simple. Are you actually free? Or do you sometimes still battle with ongoing guilt or shame? Guilt of, because of what you have done, shame because of what, has, what has been done to you. Even though you have repented and you've received forgiveness and you've actually even extended forgiveness, do you still feel that you haven't been declared not guilty by God? But actually, you've been given a suspended sentence. Do we all know what a suspended sentence means? It actually means that you've been found guilty, but you're not going to be sentenced this time. It's basically the sword above the head. So you've been found guilty. 
we are going to give you a suspended sentence of five years. Should you have a misstep in that five years, that sword falls and we add the new lot with it. So do you feel declared not guilty or do you feel that there's kind of tread easily, tread lightly because actually I've, I've, I've just been declared guilty with a suspended sentence and at any moment this grace period, this period or this window of grace that God is extending to you can evaporate. Do you feel that God is watching you and not in a good way and not in a wonderful way because I trust he's watching me. And I trust he's enjoying it. Are you able to run into the Father's arms with delight and joy to pray and to worship? Or are you timidly and respectfully preferring to stay at a bit of a distance, close enough to wave at God, but also far enough to run if it would be necessary? It's condemnation, and it's not from God. God, and this is the thing, God does not smile at our feelings of condemnation. He doesn't see it as plausible or as a form of holiness or as some form of warped spiritual maturity. Condemnation is low-grade guilt and shame. It is not humility. It is not a good thing, and it's not of God. On the contrary, God is glorified when we realize that the cross of Jesus was sufficient and that the blood of Jesus washed away all of our transgressions and that we have been fully justified by the sacrificial death of Jesus and that it has all been done and that there is nothing to be added to the cross of Jesus but only to live in full acceptance and full rejoicing thereof. When we're at that place, God rejoices. That glorifies God. Would you listen to the story quickly? You can close your eyes or not. She first noticed him near the city gate on the day that her family moved to Jerusalem. In fact, he came over and spoke to her while her father was meeting with the elders at the fountain gate. She was overwhelmed by so many things that morning, leaning against the rough stones of the wall as she peered into this vast city. She'd never seen so many people or heard so much noise. And then she felt a hand on her shoulder. It was him. She dropped her eyes to the ground and shyly answered his questions about where they were from, about her father, about her family, and about her age. He seemed friendly. And as he turned away, he smiled and pushed a coin into the palm of her hand. Her first coin. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. Is this what the city is like? Winding streets filled with people, merchants, markets, laughter, shouts, smells of spices. So much overwhelming life. She'd almost completely forgotten about the generous man she had met that day until she saw him in the market again. Weeks later, his laughter could have been heard from a distance as he threw a young boy up in the air and caught him again in outstretched arms. She smiled and stared at him for a while, and as she turned, in a moment, their eyes met. He instantly put the boy down and rushed over to her. He remembered her. He spoke gently to her and laughed a lot. But suddenly they were interrupted. The little boy was tugging at his robe. Abba, Abba. He picked him up and disappeared into the crowd. After this chance meeting, she regularly found herself searching the crowd and through the faces in the market to find his. But weeks passed. At the widow's stall, where she collected the olive oil, before she could pay for it, a hand reached over her shoulder and dropped the two drachma coin into the outstretched hand of the widow. The widow glared at someone behind her. As she turned, he laughed and grabbed her by the hand. It was him, and he came for her. She followed him through the market, running down narrow streets and felt as if she was flying, and then suddenly he stopped, opened the door, and pulled her inside. 
He placed a jar of oil on the floor and then came and stood very close to her. He removed her veil and then kissed her on the mouth. Her eyes closed and her heart leapt. He took her by the hand and led her into her bedroom. Moments later, she heard shouting as armed men rushed into the room. He leapt out of the window and ran, leaving her behind, naked and bleeding. They dragged into the streets, past the market. The widow, pointing at her, spat on the ground. They continued towards the temple area. Do we have scriptures yet? Nothing. I'm going to John chapter 8, verse 3 to 11. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the very act of adultery. Now the law of Moses demand that such women be stoned. But now, what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and then said, If any one of you is without sin, let him be the first one to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. At this, those who were there started to go away one at a time. The older ones first until... Only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. Jesus straightened up and he said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she answered. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Now go and live your life of sin. Then neither do I condemn you. Now go. And live your life of sin. Now this morning, I really believe the Father wants each one of us to put on her sandals. She was dragged into the presence of Jesus. I'm convinced, naked and bleeding. And she didn't have a clue what to expect. But in the presence of Jesus, she found forgiveness and acceptance. She found dignity and restoration. And she was able to let go of a condemnation forever. I can imagine that there would have been tears. Tears that started as tears of shame and guilt and rejection. But I trust that soon those tears changed into tears of joy, of gladness, of forgiveness, of acceptance, of devotion and of worship. You see, even though our sinful nature is a reality, the blood-stained cross of Jesus Christ is an even greater reality. We are fully and completely justified and set free in Christ Jesus. We are fully, completely justified and set free in Christ Jesus. Once we've received this revelation, we can never allow condemnation to come and pack our bags for us again. The problem is, you see, that condemnation has the filthy habit of returning in the morning like bad breath. You wake up and it's there again. And we need to be armed And ready for it. Because if we're not, we'll either obligingly put on the heavy backpack of condemnation for yet another day, or we'll promise to try harder and do better this time. Legalism. And so we are the pendulum from condemnation into or into legalism. But resolving to do better tomorrow does not deal with with the condemnation of yesterday. Resolving to try harder and therefore do better tomorrow does not solve the baggage that we're carrying from yesterday. So I want us to be armed and ready for condemnation. I want us to actually know how to deal with condemnation. And so for those people that like the five steps too, here's one. 
Five steps to dealing with condemnation. Firstly, we accept the life-changing words of Paul as he writes to Timothy. 1 Timothy 1, verse 15. Here is a trustworthy saying that Jesus Christ came into this world to save sinners, of which I am the worst. Accept these words, that this is why Jesus came. Jesus himself said, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. Jesus did not come into this world to find the few that were doing well spiritually. He came to save sinners like us. That's the first thing we need to do. That's why Jesus came. Accept that fact. Secondly, then confess your sins to God. 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. So we accept the reality that he came for us as sinners. We, we confess our sins to him. And then thirdly, we believe that God has forgiven us once we have repented. We accept it, we believe it, and now we, be we accept, confess, and now we believe that the cross was actually for you and that God's wrath was poured out on Jesus so that you and I can be forgiven. So 103 verse 2 says, as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed your sins or your transgressions from you. The fact that Jesus was resurrected from the dead, ascended to heaven, and seated at the right hand of the Father proves that his cross was accepted. His death paid the full penalty, that it was fully accepted by the Father. And so you and I do not have to carry the weight of condemnation anymore. Fourthly, extend the same forgiveness that you have received to others. Portion of the, the Lord's Prayer in Luke chapter 11 verse 4 says the following. Forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who sins against us. Forgive us our sins, because we also forgive everyone who sins against us. Oh, but you don't know what happened to me. I'm not about to forgive. I'm not, well, one day perhaps, but just not now. It's too soon. It's only been 27, 28 years, I think. <laughs> I just need to suck on this a bit more. I just can't. And I know that some horrific stuff has happened to a lot of good people. Sometimes Christians are the easiest to offend and the slowest to forgive. Extend the same forgiveness. Lastly, rejoice. Number five, rejoice. Rejoice in the fact of the cross of Jesus Christ, that in the cross of Jesus Christ, you have found the cross of forgiveness. And then thank God for the cross that has completely, permanently, fully cleansed you from all unrighteousness. I don't know, do, do, is, is the band kind of ready-ish? Not yet? Can, do, will we have sound if we, the band comes up? Okay. We obviously have sound, but we don't have other bed. So that, okay. All right, folks. Let's, we're gonna, we have more than enough time. We are going to break bread later on, but I want us just to stop here for a moment. It's just based on, on so many nods that I saw earlier. Why don't you close your eyes before we're going to worship? Let's close our eyes and take a minute to walk ourselves through these, call it five steps. But firstly, we accept the words of Paul or of Jesus. Let's go with Jesus, always better. When he says, it is not, it's not the healthy that needs a doctor, but the sick. Jesus Christ came into this world to seek and to save sinners. Secondly, that we confess our sins to God, for he is faithful and just to remove our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 
And then to believe that God has forgiven you. Once and for all, completely. And removed all of your sin from you. As if it never, ever happened. As far as the east is from the west. It's not just a case of the prodigal coming home and his filthy rags being covered by a, a new garment. It is forgiveness. It's not just atonement covering over. It is the blood of Jesus washing away completely as if it never happened. Like me, I'm sure you've often wished that you've never done, never said, never whatever. When we understand forgiveness, it means that in Him, we've never done, we've never said. It just didn't happen. And then extend that forgiveness. Extend that same restitution, that same grace that you've received. Extend that to others that have offended you and rejoice. Rejoice in the cross. Even as the prodigal son returned, he came back with tears, saying, I'm no longer worthy. Bags of condemnation. I'm not worthy. But yet it ends with music and dancing and celebration because he understood the heart of the Father. Zephaniah 3, 17. The Lord your God is with you. He is mighty to save. He will take great delight in you and he will quiet you with his love and he will rejoice over you with singing. The Lord your God is with you. He is mighty to save. He will take great delight in you. He will quiet you with his love. And he will rejoice over you with singing. So now, drop your luggage and your baggage for good. And release all condemnation and guilt and shame to Jesus. And let him flood you with all of his grace and joy and love and forgiveness and acceptance forever and ever. Amen.